Why don't I just start with the other language of my country? No um, Paniki Aho, Ko Victoria, University of Wellington, Kiwananga, Ko Jeff McClay Aho, which is basically saying I'm Jeff McClay from Wellington, from Victoria University, still Victoria University of Wellington. There's a bit of a, a, a debate about that at the moment. I've been exiled by my vice chancellor who won't speak to me about that issue. <laughs> um, but what I want to do today is to talk about, first of all, why I find this project really interesting, and then to give some reflections on independence and implementation from a New Zealand perspective. I'm always very conscious when I speak in other countries as to why anybody would be interested in a very small country um, at the other end of the world with four and a half million people, the size of the city of Melbourne and half the size of the city of London. But I think there are really interesting things about what we've done with this Law Commission model, and I think in particular um, the other Geoffrey from Wellington, I'm forever telling people that I'm the wrong Geoffrey from Wellington, um, Sir Geoffrey Palmer, who some of you will have heard speak, his model of Law Commissions, which I don't completely agree with, does, I think, provide a really profound challenge to the traditional English um, and Commonwealth model of Law Commissions and what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. So I want to talk a bit about that as well. Um, my personal interest in this project is having been appointed to the Law Commission, like many people who come from academia and I think from the judiciary, um, I was somewhat shocked when I first encountered policy work because what I found to be obvious was not obvious and what people on the other side, the policy people, thought was obvious was not at all obvious to me. And it caused me quite a lot of emotional distress for the first year or so that I was working because I thought that I was a clever and educated chap and suddenly to be confronted by a whole world demanding answers that I couldn't really give um, deeply concerned me. And equally now when I've returned back to the law faculty, I really struggle with my colleagues because having experienced this world, I find many of the things that they are concerned about essentially irrelevant and unimportant. <laughs> um, the same things that I thought were very important. And the central inquiry of this leads me to, well, why do we have law commissions um, why do we think lawyers should do law reform? And what specialties do we actually have in that process? I think these are really important questions to think about because, in fact, law reform has been done all the time, all over this city, I'm sure, and all over Wellington, all over Australia, and all over um, Ireland, or wherever else we might want to think, and all over everywhere, and being done very well by non-lawyers. And so we have to always ask, well, what is it that we expect lawyers to be doing that is different? Um, and so that's sort of where I've come to land is try and figure out well what's valuable about what our model and what isn't. Um, what gives them a special role and what claim do we have? And I think lawyers do have claims that they make about law reform. They claim to be uniquely um, capable of law reform. They claim to have unique perspectives. In my experience, particularly judges claim to have unique experiences which they will use, um, which is largely based on cases that they may have heard um, and <coughs> injustices that may have occurred in a particularly isolated case that they've heard. This is a complete contrast to the policy world, which is not often concerned about individual cases. And so, what well, my short answer why lawyers should keep on doing law reform is because we are trained to look at particular cases and particular justice claims in particular minutiae in a way that policy analysts are not. But that does raise real questions about how we as a community of law reformers, who are lawyers, interact with the policy community. Um, so I particularly also think we need to consider that the world has changed, that the world brought us the Law Commission here 52 years ago, is it now 52 years? 50. And there's a different world in terms of the effect of the common law. I think that I would I think that essentially I know in New Zealand and I know in Australia and I'm very sure here the principal concern was reforming the inequities of old statutes, old law statutes, old legal law statutes, real law statutes like my the 1925 Trust Act would be a, a classic Trust Act would be a classic example or bizarre the classic sort of things the rule in Blaine Bain and Fothergall there's a classic New Zealand Law Commission report you know there's some silly case that is to giving some kind of interest in some kind of case that should have a report and should be changed. Interestingly enough, I don't think that's actually really an important business of law commissions now, and I think we need to change the way we assess this. Um, New Zealand Law Commission issued 20 years ago a contribution report which has not been enacted. Um, 
And that's kind of okay, because the courts just changed it. Like, our contribution law is, we have sort of 1947, or the Law Reform Act equivalent uh, here, uh, without its reforms, and we just changed it. The court basically said that the problem with contract and tort claims, well, who cares? Um, and the, actually, judges are actually quite good at my new law reform now, and they've got used to something that that's what they ought to be doing. What, in fact, is happening in the law reform community is this wider systemic um, stuff dealing with larger problems, dealing with problems of the regulatory state, which really are the problems of the law at the moment, not the kinds of classic common law issues that we were founded to deal with. But I want to talk about the topic for today, which is, um, which is about independence and implementation. And when I talked about this to my colleagues at home when I said I was coming here, one of my smartest colleagues suggested that it's probably useful to think about different kinds of independence, that it's not really a good idea just to say independence, because people mean independent in different ways. And just looking at my colleagues out in the Law Commission, we had a, a judge that I know at least one of you knows, um, a Court of Appeal judge, a very good Court of Appeal judge. His view of what independence is is very different from my colleague, um, who was a former cabinet minister's view of his independence, versus my view of what an academic uh, was. If there was a common theme in this independence, it would be a reliance on our own individual judgment. That I think particularly judges, when they think they're being independent, they're really referring to, I am being told to use my independent judgment. And that's what we want judges to do. That's what their, their core business is every day of their professional career. And I'm in awe of people that do that, frankly, because I'm never quite sure what I think about anything. Um, but equally, as an academic, you know, I take an own, a legal academic, I would say my independence is based on my training, but it's really a matter of individual judgment. Now, I think that is not the kind of independence that law commissions want. I think that's wrong headed. I took the view after about six months of law commission that nobody was interested about my personal opinion. And in fact, there are a number of reports that I signed which I personally disagree with. The example, from a personal perspective, for example, I would use it in a law commission here has a reference what we would call harmful digital communications at the moment. Personally, I'm more on the free speech side of things than probably is reflected in that report. But there are law reform reasons why we should do that report. Um, and the most important of which was that people were just being charged under old, irrelevant offences. It was much better to have a new bells and whistles offence that was, had proper free speech protections. But the real point I want to make is that we should assess independence across a framework of the sorts of people who are being appointed to these bodies, because they will bring with their own vision of what independence actually is. Um, what I think it actually means, at least in New Zealand, is that there is no ultimate political control over the policy process. And it doesn't mean that we should run an individual judgment or what do we think process, it means we should run a proper policy process, but without the predetermined politics that is often accompanied with general government reform. And the example which I use always about this, when I first wrote my first issues paper, which was on something which doesn't, I don't think really exists in the UK, um, we had a special kind of corporate form for non-profit organisations. We share this with Australian states. And I wrote a really good report about it, and I went to a community group to explain my report, my issues paper, and I said, well, and I first said, please make submissions. And this man put his hand up and said, but why will we make submissions to you? And I was somewhat taken aback, because I thought, I look quite nice, don't I? I think I did my fly up or something. <laughs> and then I said, oh, because I read them. And then fortunately, sitting next to was another woman who had interacted with the Royal Commission in a different environment, and she said, no, what he really means is, why would we bother making submissions to you? Because you're just the government. And the government has already decided what it's going to do. Mm. Because a minister had told the government, told the officials, ultimately the parameters in which the as must and adopt democracy, the parameters in which the officials can work. Of course, they can change that a little bit. But and she said, but you can make submissions to the Commission, they will listen to you, because they don't have to do what the minister says. And that's the key difference, and what's most important about the New Zealand model, at least in terms of independence, is that the minister doesn't control what's going to be done. And that, that actually has a, a much more important dynamic than our decision-making process, because it means that people trust us. Um, the English Law Commission talked about 
the stakeholder um, trust. And that's extremely strong where I come from because of this lack of direction. And so independence feeds into the core competency of the report, of the commission. People will tell us things, like I could talk when I did my closed procedure report, um, security information, I could talk with equal trust and faith with the, the services and the people who really did not trust the services. And both groups had no problem with my basic independence. I was not being directed to make a particular decision. Similarly, when I did the extradition reference that we did, um, extradition in New Zealand is an extremely critical, complex um, problem because of one particular person who is very, very wealthy and is being extradited to the United States, maybe, um, who started a political party to oppose his um, extradition and was involved in a parliamentary election during my term. As a, the government clearly could just not review extradition law in those circumstances. But I could. Um, well, the Commission could. So the question then from New Zealand is, well, that, if that's right, then do, where do we stop? What's the proper use of this, of this mechanism? And so to Jeffrey's challenge, which I don't completely agree with, is that this Law Commission model presents a way of doing policy without politics. Jeffrey is a very, um, is a completely reformed former Prime Minister. He doesn't believe, it seems, in politics, um, <laughs> or that politics will ever do any good whatsoever in the world. Um, but there's this idea that somehow we can do policy without politics as a result of this in in independence. And I'm not sure that's completely true, and I'm going to finish off with some observations about that, because I think it's, it's wrong in, in some senses. Um, but there are some dis what I would call discontents of independence too. The first has already been referred to by our friends from the English and Wales Law Commission. Um, money. It's all very well to have a statutory independence, if you don't have your own budget, we have a particular procedure in New Zealand, um, a permanent appropriation procedure, how we pay our judges, we have a similar thing here. The Law Commission doesn't have one of those. It's subject to the things and arrows of budget process. Also is subject to this terrible thing where we have a statutory procedure to raise our salaries as Law Commissioners, um, but there was no um, extra money coming from the government as a result of that. So the terrible thing was when our salaries went up, we had to get rid of them, not we didn't get rid of them, but we couldn't hire more researchers who actually did the work. When well, there's a paradox, um, I would have probably given away my salary increases, but I was probably in a minority. Um, <laughs> and so, part of the study you need to understand is that what institutional arrangements are, because they are really important about money and these understand memorandums of understanding and program selection. I was talking at the break with Matthew about the trust project. Um, that trust project, which is now a bill, which has now come back to the committee and will be an act, I hope. This is for Micah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is flawed because it's not a complete project. The reason it's not a complete project is because we lost ministerial priority to complete what are essential parts of the reform. And whenever we were drafting certain parts of the bill, I would keep on coming back to, but the minister stopped us from doing that particular thing. The last bit, of it. so you know, understand independence is really important not just to look at statutes but to look at the institutional arrangements. Cooperation, um, um, there's a bit of an issue going on in New Zealand about um, giving references where the government's already decided what it's going to do. We have one when I was at the Law Commission involving non fatal strangulation, which is where people, mostly men, throttle their domestic partners. Um, the government will decide to legislate this and make a particular crime. I have no idea why they have this Law Commission. Uh, I have no idea why the Law Commission accepted this project other than we were told to do it. We reached the conclusion the government wanted us to. Personally, I felt that diminished our independence. It was a very good project, it was very well written, and if Linda's watching this, she did a fantastic job <laughs> writing the report. Um, but that was pointless. The, last night, the government, the Law Commission issued its report on abortion law reform, which again is a similar, I think, frankly, um, flawed document from what I could see this morning, because the government has already said that it's going to remove abortion from the Crimes Act. It's already said it's going to do with a health issue. The Law Commission doesn't even make any recommendations in this report. It says if you, there are three options, you can choose one of them. Well, that's not the job of the Law Commission. The job of the Law Commission is to run a policy program and then make a recommendation about what the proper way of doing things is. And there's a, this tendency to sort of, um, both our governments, to use the Law Commission as a way of sanctifying what you're already doing, um, which I don't agree with. Um, there's also the question of how far you press independence. Um, 
there are things that you just can't recommend in our legal system. So, for example, when I was the commission, we had a reference in relation to sexual, sexual violence um, trial processes, alternative trial processes project. Is it realistic to recommend the abolition of jury trials? Like, seriously, if you make that report, if you make that recommendation, you're not going to get it enacted, even though you might think it's a better way of dealing with these sorts of offences, and you're going to destroy your report, because I guarantee you, as soon as you release this report, all the media is going to talk about, all the lawyers are going to talk about is ancient freedoms, and magna, for goodness sake, magna carta, and everything else, and then you're going to lose, your, you're going to lose everything that's good in your report. So there's times when you make decisions that aren't political with a nasty political context, but we are seriously political um, concerned just about... I have to be, be careful here. Um, I have a particular hatred of law commissions doing study papers. I think they are a significant um, drain on independence. I think the job of law commissions is to make recommendations to do a policy process. I, I call them in my notes the pie in the sky projects. <coughs> I don't think we should do them. Um, that's what academics are actually better at, frankly. Academics, James, will agree they're better at pie-in-the-sky stuff. <laughs> um, we're about doing pro policy process. Um, and also, you've got to be careful of what is actually um, of, of other norms. Um, after I left the Law Commission, a, a decision was made to change our project on the reform of contempt to include a statutory scandalisation offence. Now, I deeply oppose this offence. I've made a submission uh, this a submission to collect scrutiny. But what was interesting about this submission, this decision, was that it completely corrupted the whole parliamentary process because what you had then was the commission used its independence and said we need to protect our judges. The result was that everybody who turned up to the committee for days upon days talked about free speech. And so everything else, every, all the other benefits of the statute uh, were somewhat missed. Um, I have three or four more minutes, Enrico. Yes. Um, now, um, what was it? Sorry, I just lost myself. Um, there are some other issues which are more complex, which I've talked about a little bit in my other paper. Is that the Palmer model of the Law Commission? So previously, basically, New Zealand Law Commission had before nine, before two thousand had a very distinguished before two thousand and ten a very distinguished history of not of great reports that were not enacted. So Geoffrey understood that the real problem here was. A degree, I think, a disconnection between officials and law commission staff. And if you wanted my basic metric for what, what will be adopted is your ability to get in the skins or in the head of officials and your ability to co-opt them to get your reports um, adopted and to recommend to ministers that they are good things. Um, that's a really important. Now the problem is that if I talked about this in Australia, I would be told that this is corrupting that this is something which is not appropriate for law reform bodies um, in the extent that we have, and I have been told this, because basically my fingerprints are all over um, the trust bill that's been in Parliament. Letting it go seems pointless. I know a lot about it. I can tell people I can help. Why stop? But that does involve, once you get involved in that process, you have to decide what independence you're going to give away as part of that process. Once you get involved in a ministerial process or a parliamentary process, I had a protocol with the officials on the trust bill that said that when I would speak in select committee, I would say certain things I could record as a fact, for example, I could record as a fact, perhaps, that what the Law Commission has said, but I was there to provide the ministry's advice, not the, not the Law Commission's advice. Again, some people would think that is an abrogation of, an, of independence. I just thought it was practical common sense. Um, some words about implementation, because it's also the topic here. Um, so Jeffrey, th Jeffrey posits that really law commission models way of law reform without without politics, and I think that's wrong. And I think it's wrong and dangerous to suggest that any law reform should be done without politics. I actually think that making law is about politics, and you should convince people, even about narrow, dull law reform stuff. It's actually really important that you take democracy and the political process very seriously. And I think I've always put to one side talk of these second chambers or advance or particular special processes, because in some ways they're sort of beside the point to me. The most important thing as part of the project, and Matthews will talk a little bit about that, is being able to convince a minister that this is worth, and there's these three questions that a Yale academic once mentioned in a seminar, which I live by now. 
you've got to be able to convince a minister ultimately why this, of all the things in the world that you could change as a minister, why would you choose this? Why should you choose to do it now as opposed to all the other priorities you have? And why me? Why should I spend my precious time in Matthew explaining in, in England, ministers maybe have shorter periods of time than our ministers have. <coughs> Very. But that seems to me an innately political process, and sometimes it's a matter of targets. Like explaining to Matthew that we've been trust project went through three or four, is now its fourth minister, all of whom had different priorities. One minister um, was completely dismissive, I think, of the trust reform. If she had not been involved, she had not been involved with um, a um, political blogger who was involved in some very scurrilous things at, at some point, she would have remained the minister and my trust project would have died. Um, that's probably true. Um, that's why she resigned and we got a, a former trust practitioner from Christchurch as the Minister of Justice and she, she made an absolute priority of her tenure. Um, but I think that these are really important things to be able to convince. You don't have this, James referred to this, the tightening of tightening reports. So I always thought as part of this process, it's actually really important to be able to summarise why does this really count for the country? So we have auditors, or the law commission has auditors that come in, and that was a challenge, not whether we're nicking the money, but actually the challenge was to say, what value are we giving to New Zealand? Um, how do we make the world better? And the fact is that changing the world, and the rule in Bain and Fothergill, is of marginal importance to the people of New Zealand. So you have to figure out why this is important. So the trust reforms that have gone through, or going through, are important because we you would sell it as a as a very dry technical thing. Our sale pitch is that in New Zealand there are 500,000 discretionary family trusts, of which many New Zealanders have absolutely no idea what their trustee obligations are, treat the property as their own, and do all sorts of things, and, and up until they get separated or they become insolvent, and then a court has to look at them. And my message to the trust industry were, you might not like everything in our bill, but it's better than having some high court judge trying to do justice in a family separation case, voiding or shamming your trust. Better for us to set down what a trust might be. Um, so it's about trying to find a political message, and I think that's really important part of the law reform process. In fact, if you were to ask what I did for the last seven years, it was not anything about the law of trust, of which I know scandalously little still. Um, it's talking to being prepared to talk to people. And every lawyer I talk to, when I said that we are going to put in our trust bill the duties of trustees, looked at me in absolute shock and horror when I started out. Within half an hour, I had good 90% of them with me. But that was a, essentially a political process of talking with them, bringing them along and trying to convince them that I wasn't quite crazy so that when they talked to their, their body or the minister got the idea, they got a sense that these were responsible people who were doing responsible things. Um, but I just get back to that idea that we, at New Zealand, we've taken a very pragmatic view to what the implementation process actually involves. And the then question becomes, when do you, how do you keep the independence of these bodies? Because as I said at the very beginning, the real value we have is that independence. And that's a very hard road to hoe. Um, and it's something you're never going to get quite right. Um, but New Zealand probably is, the, although we have a statute that looks very like the English and Wales statute, I think we've got similar problems and similar difficulties. I think that we've tried to develop things in a much, try to make ourselves not a government department, but certainly tried to work very hard. And I was t told people that one of my key jobs as a commissioner was actually in Wellington was just to have coffee with people. But after about a year, I realised the most important thing I could do was not actually to write law reports, which caused some grief to me as an academic, but was to go and talk to people and to find out what was actually going on. And the key thing is to try and structure these commissions so that they have enough of those connectivity without losing the independence which they live by. That's what I came to say.